Why do we need Zig Dan when we've got Tim Sherwood? And that, now Jack liked to drink, but he must have been absolutely <laughs> blottoed when he said that. <laughs> There's never a ceiling for Harry. He still thinks he could go higher and higher. And that's the mentality you need. Hi everyone and welcome along to our Grand National Special Studs Up. And for the first time ever, I'm delighted to say that as you can see, we are in our Studs Up dressing room. And alongside me, Charlie Austin, my Studs Up strike partner, and our special guest for the Grand National Special, Tim Show. We're good to see you, Tim. Thanks for joining us. And Charlie, great to finally see you after all this time on Zoom. I know, mate. I can't believe we're here. Finally, it's been a long 10 weeks, 12 months, I think, 12 weeks away for everybody. But um, for me and you, mate, it's, I'm delighted to see you in person. And we've, we've been on the road to Cheltenham, and now we're looking forward to, to Aintree. But the football continues for you. A busy time of it just now at, at Easter. How did you get on? Played good Friday against Coventry, won 3-0. It was a dominant performance from start to finish. And then we played Monday and got beat 3-1 to Nottingham Forest, which was uh, just put down to a bad day at the office. It happens, and we move on now. There'll be people listening to this podcast um, brought to, to everyone by Oz Checker and Skybet. There'll be people watching it. And for those watching it, they'll be able to see that you've brought your 50 know, goals hey. QPR shirt in. I know. I, I, do you know what happened? I actually, it was in the back of the car. I should have brought a 45 Austin shirt, but I just thought, oh, I'll just bring just a 50. Just to remind everyone. Just remind everyone I got to 50 for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I go with a 50 one to remind everyone. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see you. I, I know that probably in, in the, the punditry world and what have you, it's a busy time for, for Easter, but have you got one eye on the, on the Grand National coming up on Saturday? It's always exciting, isn't it, the Grand National? You know, I love Ascot, um, love Cheltenham, and then the Grand National comes around. So, um, shame there's going to be no fans, but, you know, we've, it's better than, better than nothing. You know, to, uh, I've been to Aintree myself, and, you know, it's a great occasion. It's a um, lottery of a race, you know yourself. Um, you admire the jockeys, you know, to get over them jumps, you know, our, the bravery of them guys, you know, the athletes, what they are, and the strength and the concentration, what they need to be able to go the distance. Um, you know, I admire them greatly. You know, it's a fantastic achievement for them to be able to do it, and rather them than me. Yeah, that's that's about it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you speak on behalf of all three of us, uh, Jim, <laughs> yeah. I tell you. It does take an awful lot of bottle and throughout the course of, of this week's Grand National Special we'll hear from a few of the leading players as well so we'll get the insight from those who are lining up in the big race but what, what happens in football clubs up and down the country is you can, you can both tell us your, your Grand National experiences because will you, like everyone up and down the country, Chaz, in the QPR dressing room be doing sweepstakes and whatnot yeah of course everyone every football club i've done it not only that but when i was non-league days we used to do the sweepstake as well the football club used to do it but the the timings used to be four o'clock didn't they yeah. it used to be at half time remember when i was playing for kimbury and hungry used to try and delay the kickoff for the second half about 10 minutes would you watch the race in the had, not just time? me but the the whole every footballer that was involved in the days you know i mean the opposition team we were just piling the club i was watching <laughs> ref would blow his whistle you straight back out <laughs> do you know what i mean but everyone just buys into it even the people that are not into racing 365 days, you know what I mean? But for that one special event, it's the most watched race in the world, isn't it? Do you if, know what I mean? if you, when you were managing, right, if, if it was grand, because obviously football's on Saturday when Grand National's on, and they have moved the time now to accommodate that so you can watch the football and then watch the race. But before then, I, I guess when you were managing, it was probably still at four o'clock. So if, if you're giving a half-time tea talk, say your team are down and you've got someone on their phone watching the Grand National, are you no, going to give them a right bollock? No, <laughs> that, don't, that don't happen. That don't, that don't happen. <laughs> that ain't happening. Listen, the majority of the dressing room now are foreign players, so they're not even, they don't know what horse racing is. You know, they have no interest whatsoever. And you get a group of English guys who and appreciate, you know, when it's the festivals, you know, certainly Cheltenham as well. I remember Harry Redknapp when he was manager of Spurs, he, he, he set it all out for us to go to, to Cheltenham. And uh, I swear to you, we had to drag players onto that bus to go. Really? I mean, we was all there early as you like, you know, with our paper, studying the form and and you, you're dragging the foreign players on there. I mean, they have no interest whatsoever in horse racing. You can imagine, though, like the Grand National in Cheltenham, and, and particularly Ascot, actually, to a foreign player where racing isn't a big part of the culture. Because mm. in England and, and yeah. a few, few nations, it's a massive part of our, our, our culture and our sort of youth, really, I think. But to them, if they got off the bus at Cheltenham in the Guinness Village, they're looking around going, what, what are we doing? Where are we? Let me tell you though, Ollie, when, it, when they get there and they see it and they see the atmosphere and they see the crowds and the roars, and, which unfortunately we haven't seen for a while in, in any stadiums, and they see the horses and they know what athletes and, they, and the bravery and the fences and how high they are and what it takes, 
you know, I think they show an utmost respect, you know, for, for what's actually in front of them. But to actually get them there, drag them there, you know, you have to, they have to be there, you know, drag them through the door to, uh, to actually get them to appreciate it. But once you get the bug, and that's the thing with racing, it doesn't really leave you, does it? And, and the Grand National, I think, ramps up a level because it's not just the eyes of the racing world, which perhaps are on Cheltenham and Ascot, but the whole of sport is focused on, on entry. And the city of Liverpool comes alive. You've probably played countless games in the city of Liverpool throughout your career. That is a city that absolutely adores their sport, isn't it? They do. I think just with racing, that the Grand National is so effective. And you know what I mean? Affection is there for everybody to, to buy into. Football is, is a massive city. Two teams hammer and tongs every week. Do you know what I mean? And everyone just buys into it. They love their, they love their sport up there. And then with everybody in, in England and, and Ireland, love the Grand National. They all just pile in for three days of of madness. We had a 150 to 1 winner in the Irish Grand National on Sunday so there's hope for everyone as well. I'm sure the 100 to 1 shots will be being sided with on Saturday. We'll, d we'll discuss some of the um, the big prized horses and the, the story horses if you like but before we look at this year's runners how did you get into racing? How did your sort of love affair with the sport happen? My family were bookmakers so my okay. dad my dad and my, my uncle they set up high street betting shops for the Playboy Club back in the day um, and then my uncle is Alan Kinghorn, he set up Kinghorns, which is a, on Rao's bookmaker credit. And my dad worked for the company as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, if I asked him now and say, did you love it? He used to tell you no, you know, and, I, and I, when I spoke to my uncle about it, and I just said, what was the life like? He said, well, you, whatever you got in your pocket at the beginning of the season, you go like this, you go like that, keep going like that. And in the end of it, you probably got the same amount, in there, <laughs> you know, but it takes a few years off your life, you know, the yeah. stress of it. But my dad gave it up when I started to get into the first team, you know, coming through as a player because Saturdays was obviously a big day for racing um, and he wanted to watch me play. So, and also there was a few footballers who bet with him who owed him a few quid. So uh, <laughs> well, it was very difficult for him to go and get the money back. That must have been a great experience, though, growing up with your dad. I mean, if, if someone said to me that my old man was going to work for the Playboy Club and I was a kid, I'd bite their hands off. Okay, right, dad, I'm coming to work. Oh, Can I do work for you? I, I live now just around the corner from um, Albury, and uh, there was a Stocks. Yeah. Stocks, yeah, where they used to train the bunny girls. The, the bunny girls used to train, uh, train them up there. And in the summer, we used to go to garden parties there. My dad used to obviously get invited and we used to go there. And I, it, was, it was interesting. What were they yeah. like? Well, the bunny girls. Were the, <laughs> the party <Okay>. too. <laughs> <laughs> the bouncy castle was right. <laughs> <laughs> Madness. Work experience, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did my work experience there. They had an office in uh, Tottenham Court Road. Did um, you actually? I did my work experience there, yeah. So uh, I used to do the board. Right, right up and would it have, if if you weren't a good footballer and obviously kicked on as a footballer, would would it would racing and, and a career in in bookmaking have been something you went down to? Reckon? Yeah, I'd probably be in a golfer. That's <laughs> <laughs> everyone else's yeah. dream. Masters this no, good I would have been definitely a bookmaker. Really, I would have, I would think so. Yeah. You, do you know all the tic tac and stuff? No, no. You don't need to now, obviously. But I remember no. growing up watching it with Big Mac in the betting ring doing yeah. all that. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I remember seeing him there all the time. When I used to go there, and my dad was on the rails because they had, they had pitches at, at all the big events, and then pitches used to be worth a lot of money. And I remember him saying, "You know, that's our pension." You know, all of a sudden, all everything went online, and then pitches were actually worth square root of zero. Yeah which was bad news. I tell you what, I, we're going off on a slight tangent, but when I first started work at, at Racing UK when I was 18, just left school and Babe Station used to work out at Teddington Studios, but they didn't have a- What's that? What is it? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know, Charlie knows. Charlie knows. <laughs> hey, don't throw me under the bus here, mate. <laughs> anyway, so, anyway, we probably can't keep this in the edit, but I'll tell you anyway, because they'll cut it out. But they, they didn't have a female toilet on the fifth floor, which is where the Racing UK edit suite was, which is where I used to work. So they had to change in the blokes lose on the fifth floor. And there was a changeover in the programmes at eight o'clock. So every eight o'clock I was there. Need a week of See you in a <laughs> Oh, sorry to meet. Sorry, Sharon. Didn't mean to see you. <laughs> Madness. Love it. I hope they keep this in. <laughs> I hope they keep this in. It was actually, we'll, we'll get onto the horses in a moment, but it was England Tobago in the in England Trinidad and Tobago in the World Cup. So they all had their England sort of outfits on. It was very nice. Anyway, I remember that game very well. Mm. For, obvious reasons. for obvious reasons. Yeah. England won, yeah. Brilliant. Anyway, cut that out and well done. Moving on to this year's Grand National and let's go through some of the story horses. I'm going to read out a few names because I think there'll be people listening and watching this, Tim, that will... Well, I, I suppose before I list out some of the names, the Grand National is a race where I imagine you go through and you go, right, I've got a cousin called 
Gary, so we'll back Gary, you know, like the colours you like and stuff like that. Is that what you do, Chaz? If I don't have no names in there, obviously with my kids and stuff, I just do the, the birthdays. Yeah. That's what I go for. Well, numbers. Yeah. The numbers, yeah, yeah. Often that's how I do. And then, like this year for me, cloth caps there to, to win. Unfortunately, it's not the number of uh, <laughs> yeah, me, yeah, me kids' people. birthday, but I will. I'll be back in that. I think it'll take a hell of a lot of stopping. I really do. Short price, but... Yeah. I think it's had a lot of beating. I think it'd be the sh I think it wins. It gets round, obviously not impeded. I think if it gets round, it, it wins, you know. It'd be the shortest price for 100 years or something. Yeah. You know? I so think the sad story of it, Tim, and we're all for Cloth Cup, I think the sad story is Tiger Old not running. I don't want to keep going on, but yeah. it's a sad story that he's, he's not running. It's, you imagine how many people be watching for him going for the third yeah. to win it three times. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? I'm trying to think what it would be like in a different sport, but because it's only happened once in racing before with Red Rum, you know, to, to have him not line up and make it, can you imagine how many eyeballs would be on that race if Tiger Roll was lining up this year? It is a real shame, but it's presented Cloth Cap with an unbelievable opportunity. And as you say, the shortest price favourite for, for many a year. I think 1975, there was a seven to two winner of the race, but you actually weirdly get more 100 to one winners than you do really short price favourite win the national. But on all known form to him, he looks like an absolute good thing. I think so, yeah. I mean, John Joe's been in the game so long and he's, he's won a national, hasn't he? Yeah, 80, don't, don't push it yeah. with um, AP train that horse 86 or something like that yeah. or whatever it was. So he's, um, I, I think it's about time. You know, he wins another one. He's in there, obviously, with no Tiger role, he's got a real opportunity to be able to achieve it. But, um, and normally, we talked about if it's not numbers, it's not names, then it's colours. You know, and especially at Liverpool, you know, there won't be any Everton fans who with that colour behind your yeah. shoulder there. But so. well, there is a horse running called Definitely Red as well, so I'm sure that the Liverpool fans will be siding with that horse. The, the one thing I would say, though, is that the race has changed a lot. The fences have been modified. It's not like the Grand Nationals of old, where you'd have a 12-foot drop on beaches and, you know, the, the chair was basically a brick wall. But also, as well, the loose horses, they, they, yeah. every horse can go round a fence and there's pen areas as well. So the, the welfare for the Grand National is unbelievable, second to none. But it means a horse like Cloth Cat, you don't have to have that worry of like a loose horse darting in front of you anymore. Like, so technically you should get a clear passage really. So it's quite hard to, to find a flaw in, in him. Mm. But will you be backing a horse at seven to two, four to one to win a Grand National? That's the, the question I guess everyone up and down. It the depends how on. much you're putting on. I mean, if you're putting <laughs> on a lot of money, you absolutely would. Yeah, yeah. a win's a win, isn't it? But if yeah. you're an each way punter, you know, there's no way yeah. you're betting something that short, you know, as much yeah. as uh, I want to see it win. No, I'd love to see it win like Tom Scudamore. I think he's a top jockey. Will you lads be backing him? I'm going to back him, yeah. Yeah, I'm Cloth gonna cap. Back, yeah, I'm black. Will back you back him? him? Yeah. I will, yeah. The other stories, Bristol De Meyer's top weight, he's a grey in the race. I think only four horses, that are, um, grey horses, have won the race in the past, including Neptune Colon, who Daryl Jacob rode. We'll hear from Daryl um, later on in this week's Grand National Special, but he was a brilliant guest the other day, wasn't he? Superb, mate. Honestly, just the way he was talking about... I, I, do you know what I enjoyed the most? When he was on about well, the jockeys giving it to each other when they're racing and that. So I've, in my head, I always thought, surely they must chat to each other. Because when I'm playing football, yeah. it's the same, you always give it to the opponent. Like, So I did like it when Sam Twiston Davis was sticking Do on it. Do you ever talk to footballers, either opposition on the pitch. or your own team? Obviously, I know you talk on the pitch, but about like what you're doing in the evening. And oh, no, like get off. Stuff. No, no, no. Just, I just give it to the centre-halves. Yeah. I think it's changed a bit now. I remember playing North London derbies and... You know, we needed to find an edge, and I would try to intimidate Vieira and, and Petit, and it didn't work. How did you go? Yeah. <laughs> let me tell you, I mean, uh, Petit used to bite a little bit, you know, bite back, and then. How know, would you do it though? Like verbals? Just, yeah, yeah, just try and find an edge just to put them off the game. They're obviously concentrated, they were so far superior in back in the day to what we had, so we had to try and find an edge, and. Um, I remember obviously the sporting director at Charlie's Club now, Les Ferdinand, he used to turn, he used to, turn to me and say, Tim, what are you doing? Like, I said, because I think if you pick a fight in the, in the tunnel, I think uh, I could handle the, uh, the banter. I was the one giving it out. I thought it might, you know, take him off the scent, but it didn't work. And certainly not with Patrick. He just used to look forward and as if I weren't even there, I didn't even exist. And when we were on the pitch, that's the way, the respect he gave me as well. <laughs> <laughs> what about Roy Keane? Did you ever try and get in his Yeah, you, you try everything. I remember Roy, as a very young boy, he played for Nottingham Forest. I was at Norwich at the time. And they were playing us in midweek and they had an FA Cup semi-final. And he come and two-footed me like you wouldn't believe. And he, I was a lot older than, than Roy. And I remember grabbing him by the throat on the floor as if to say, look, do you want to play in that game at the weekend? 
you know, because otherwise, and it, and it, like, same again, water off the duck's back. It was as if, like, I was talking to a piece of stone, you know, and I knew, you knew then that he was a real deal, you know, that he had that mentality that he calls it the eye of the tiger. That's exactly what he had. Were there any players that did bite? Oh, yeah, you could get them. That's why you did it, because you could thought you, you could get them. You can get them and you can take them off, you know, take them off the scent of, um, of what is in front of them. But, um, who, was the, who was the one that you knew every time you went on a pitch? You oh, there's, too, the there's too many. There's <laughs> too everyone. many. There's too many easy targets. Half of the air, <laughs> That's it, three yeah. solid ones. I think that's what I wanted to tell you the bad stuff. Yeah, you've got, just got to pick your battles. But I think that's the dark arts, isn't it? Everyone's after their small advantages. And if you can, if you, as soon as you get one, mm. That's it. When you know you're in someone's head, that's it's the best. Well, the worst thing is now the cameras are right in a tunnel. So when you're lining up, it's a North London derby. The fans outside, they hate each other. And they're watching them on the big screen, kissing and cuddling each other in the tunnel. I don't think it sends out a great message, you know, because them fans want nothing more than to have one over and the bragging rights of the, of the, the, the guys they're going to work with every day. You know, they want the bragging rights. They ask, you know, I feel from North London like I am. It, it was Arsenal or it was Tottenham. There was no Man United or Leicester shirts or Man City shirts. It was one or the other. And I think a lot of them die-hard fans are exactly the same. And the last thing they want to see is the Tottenham player talking and kissing and cuddling with the Arsenal players. I don't think it's right. I'll, I want to just ask you about the North London derby in a moment. But do you, do you reckon you can tell, like what Tim was saying there with Roy, and it's still in, the day, in today's game whether a player is going to make it when they're coming through and whether they can sort of take stuff like that. Does that still happen and can you determine how good a player is because of that? Yeah, because their, their mentality is different. It's already there. It's already set in stone. I see it with Pierre Hoiberg. When he came in at uh, Southampton, he kind of had the, the German mentality. He'd, see he'd come through Bayern Munich. And he'd come to Southampton. The winning mentality was there from day one in training. Played games exactly how he trained. Tackled, every, wanted to win everything. And I think that's what comes. It doesn't matter what you said to him. He just wasn't interested. Yeah. He just wasn't interested. And you, and you just see that for the next year he performed and the following year and then obviously he's gone on this year and he's, he's played really well for Tottenham. So I think it, it's still there, but some players are just different. They are just built different. And it is, it is in the English game. James Ward-Prowse is very, very much similar. You can't really say a lot to him. He's so driven, so focused to be the best as best as what he can be. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's anything to do with experience. I think it's just all in your makeup. I think Harry Kane is certainly one who I could tell you. I mean, when I told him he was playing in the Premier League on the Friday, so he'd waited his time. We had Saldado, who was a big money signing, who'd come in from Spain, very good player. But it just wasn't happening for him. And then when I took over, I'd give him three or four games. And I, Harry was outperforming him every day on the training field. So I said to Harry, you're going to play tomorrow. And he looked at me as if to say, yeah, about fucking time. Really? You know, it wasn't as if like, he was like nervous and I thought I knew he was going to have a sleepless night. He probably thought, can't wait. This is a chance I've been waiting for. Now it's my turn. And he was almost looked to me as if to say, why did you wait so long? And that is the mentality you need. And he, he reminds me so much of Alan Shearer, someone I played with as well, who's obviously the best striker we've ever seen in the Premier League. So wait, when, because you gave Harry his Premier League debut, right? Yeah. And you've obviously, I mean, obviously, clearly he's doing the right things in, in training. But could you say, obviously hindsight's a wonderful, a wonderful thing, but could you say back then that you, you knew he had the, the, the minerals to go and achieve what he's gone on to achieve? Yeah, I, I could say that because I knew him more than his family. His family know him as Harry Kane. I knew him as the footballer and that's what was important. So I, see a li I was around him a lot. And he never wasted one day on the training field and he still wouldn't. There's never a ceiling for Harry. He still thinks he could go higher and higher. And that's the mentality you need. He was always working on his craft, left foot, right foot, headers, you know, movement, holding the ball up, sitting into people. And he wanted to improve himself. Now, I loaned him out because I wanted him to go and get some experience in men's football. So he went to League One uh, with Leighton Orient. He went to with Kenny Jackie at Millwall. He went to Leicester, Norwich. Every single manager who had him on loan said he wouldn't play in the Premier League because he lacked. Because they were going through all these, he can't do this, he can't do that. I mean, if we look at what players can't do, no one would ever play. And you would never ever scout a player. I mean, it was such nonsense. And it was really difficult for me to the managers at the time were saying, well, Tim, if he can't play for Orient and he can't play for them, how can he play for Tottenham? And I say, because... Let's send, I used to give an example, I said, let's send Luka Modric out to Orient and see how he gets on. See if he looks like a top draw player. We, he's a Ballon d'Or winner. I said, it's difficult. When they're around better players, it becomes easier for them. This kid has got the correct mentality and that's the best thing I can say about Harry. You take ability 
You've got ability and you've got mentality, and I would take mentality over ability all day long. If you can marry the two together, you've got a serious plan. Well, you went on a rant though, didn't you, on a previous Studs Up, saying that he has to move on now. He, he, he's, he's done all he can at Tottenham. Do you stand by that? Yeah, I do, because they're not going to win the Premier League. For easy, I don't think they're good enough to win the Premier League. He can't do it on his, he can't do it on his own. And he can only really go individually, go and beat Shearer's record of 260 goals. I think he will do that. But for me, I think he should move on and go and win trophies. He deserves to. He's an unbelievable player. And I think the way Tim goes on about when he was younger and building it through, you can see how much he's worked on his game. His back to goal stuff is, is top draw. People don't realise how strong he is. When you watch him closely up close, how he rides tackles and he can almost see the defenders come and he bounces off them and he's just away, I think he's a brilliant, brilliant centre for. What would your advice be? You've clearly had a big impact on his career. What would your advice be to him now in, in light of what Charlie was saying? Well, I think my advice would be he's got to get in to speak to Daniel Levy. He's got to speak to Jose, who's the manager at the moment, and see if the ambition of the football club and the manager matches his ambition. He obviously wants to win something. He doesn't want an empty career. I think that's Jose's words. And I think an empty career means no trophies. He needs to win trophies. Charlie's absolutely right. If he stays, no matter where he plays, he could go to Southampton or, or with respect or Palace or, and he would still beat Alan Shearer's record if he stays in the Premier League. Now, he's scoring and assisting goals like you wouldn't believe. Where would they be without him? They need to keep him at the football club. Now, I think they need to, in order to keep him at the football club, he needs to be playing Champions League football. You know, and they can still do it. There's still time for them to do it. They won't do it without Harry Kane. I mean, every time he plays and they say, well, what a partnership he struck up with Son, who's a fantastic player, by the way. But then Gareth Bale comes and he has a little cameo with, with Harry Kane. And they say, oh, it's a brilliant partnership with him. Then Lucas Moura. There's one common denominator. It's Harry Kane. He's different class. He knows his appreciation. His football IQ is second to none. He comes off as a 10 and he's better than anyone as a 10. I used to say to him, He's a cross between, and I'm going to say two legend players, he's a cross between Teddy Sheridan and Alan Shearer. Now, if you're a cross between them two, you've got a lot to do. He's still not at the heights of Shearer, and he's still not, as a 10, the heights of Sheridan. But he will get there, and he's a mix between the two, and that tells you how good he actually is. It's like a sort of mashup of the greatest players from the sort of 90s England. England but he has American. it all. He does. When you watch him, you say, do you think the League, Cup, the League Cup's not enough? No, I don't think the League Cup's enough for him. It helps. I mean, we saw it with Man United back in the day when they win the League Cup and then it, it spurs them on to go and win the bigger prizes. Chelsea have done that as well, so Tottenham will be hoping that that is their thing. He loves the football club. Let's, not, let's, let's get it right. He loves it, but it depends what options there are out there for him. I think he would want to stay in the Premier League. I'm not sure. You, if, say, if Barcelona or Madrid I think it narrows that. Ollie, it narrows it down. If you stand in the Premier League, who can afford him in the Premier League? Probably two clubs. And will a lot determine what Haaland does in the summer as to what happens to yeah, Harry Kane? Absolutely. He's sort of, he's I just think it'd be, say, there. both of them for me. I think both, if one goes to Madrid or Barcelona, the other two will be looking at yeah. Harry Kane. But in the situation we're in, the circumstance we're in with the whole world and economics and that, yeah. it does come down to absolutely. the figures from, don't I it? I think we're in a, it's, a, it's a strange old world, isn't it? I, listen, I wouldn't be ringing up the guys here at Ozchecker and saying, you know, what price Harry Kane to leave? I wouldn't put my life on it. Yeah, Daniel Levy should probably back cloth cap and then put the winnings to keep him at the time. <laughs> in. Might be the way forward. There's, there's so many horses, because this is a Grand National Special that we want to talk about. And, and I'm going to just read out a few more of the, the horses that perhaps people might be siding with. Um, definitely red we touched on for the, 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 the red part of Liverpool. You've got Give Me a Copper, Fergie's got a, a, a horse in the Grand National this year. Did you ever speak? Did you ever manage against Fergie? Did you ever speak to him about racing? No, 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 not at all. He's a massive racing fan. He's also got Clanders Oboe in the bowl as well, so it could be a great weekend in Liverpool for the Man United legend, uh, Alex Ferguson. And then the horse that needs a few to get out and um, probably won't line up is Bo Bay um, for Dr. Richard Newland. Isn't your one of your children called? One of my daughters is called Bo, yeah, so I would. I would only go with names, I would definitely be betting that each way. I think if it gets it, it'd be 66 plus, yeah, yeah, something yeah. to one. So I think that's a good each way prize, you know. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it don't get um, affected anymore, you know. There's no loose horses, you know. So I think it narrows it down for them big price horses. Stories throughout, because you've got Yalarenki will be ridden by Bryony Frost. Rachel Blackmore is going to ride Manella Times. And after Cheltenham, I think most people up and down the country will be packing. That's Rachel. what I mean. Now, you look at it and they'll be thinking, right, where is she, what's she riding? What's she riding? And we're going to follow her. And I think that, that's where it was. She's in that elite top five jockeys now, isn't she? 
Yeah. I think so where we used to look, think, right, what's McCoy riding? What's Ruby Walsh riding? Now everyone would be looking off the back of Cheltenham. Where's Rachel Blackmore? What's she riding? And would people who didn't really, in your dressing room, who didn't really have a great interest in racing, chat to you about Rachel Blackmore and go, oh, have you heard about? They'd say, oh, because it was everywhere, wasn't it? It was all over the news and everything. Even my mother-in-law, she's going, oh, the, the female jockey did well today, didn't she? And I was like, yeah, did you back her? No. Like, she, she didn't really have a bet, but she knew. Do you know what I mean? That was how much racing got out there because of how well Rachel Blackmore was doing. It was amazing to see. I knew we'd click when we got in the Studs Up dressing room because you've linked me so nicely there to our first Grand National interview, as if by magic, you don't even know you're doing it. <laughs> You've got something special about you, the X Factor, Charlie Austin. Yes. Because we might have, in 2021, the first ever female rider to win the Grand National. There is Bryony Frost, Rachel Blackmore, and also on a 100 to one shot, Tabitha Worsley, who will line up in her first ever Grand National on Sub Lieutenant. So it's me and my mum, uh, we train uh, we always say sort of six and a half horses because I've got a little homebred that I don't think you'll see the track this year and uh, very much do it together and then my brother and sister-in-law are also a massive part they'll both lead him up because he's uh he's not the easiest in the paddock. <laughs> Has it been a, a dream of yours ever since you were a, a young girl to ride in the Grand National? Yeah, I mean, it's every jockey's dream, isn't it? I um, I keep meaning to dig it out, but I'm pretty sure when I left school in our, like, leaving yearbooks, it said, what do you want to achieve? And I'm, I'm pretty sure in that I wrote that I want to ride in the Grand National one day. So for it to actually become a reality some years on, hopefully, <laughs> is quite special. That is magic. And, and how's mum coping? Uh, I don't think she's slept for about two weeks, and I don't think she'll probably <laughs> sleep until Sunday. But uh, I think excitement as well as... Just a lot of fear. <laughs> Just imagine the nerves, right, as we heard from Tabitha there. It's, it's kind of amazing to think how you would feel on a horse, tapes in front of you, that row of fences ahead for your first ever Grand National. I mean, the bottle you touched on at the top, Tim, that they have, it, it is unbelievable the level of skill that they need to do what they do around there. Absolutely. And uh, you've got to give her all the credit in the world, but she would be... A lot calmer than her family will be. Yeah. You know, you can imagine her parents and grandparents and watching this race, you know, and it's, it is, you've got, to, you've got to hand it to her. You know, she's in amongst it. There's some tough competitors there and some, some real fierce, strong animals, you know, and you, I, she's obviously capable of doing it and uh, we wish her well. Well, she won the Fox Hunters a few years ago on Top Wood. The, the, as we heard from Tabitha, there is a real family affair there, but it's, They've only got, as she said, six and a half horses, basically, or six and a half horses in training. The Grand National has got a habit of throwing up just stories that only racing really can throw up, and this would probably be the story horse of, the, of, of, of this year's race. No, oh, mate, it'd be, it would be amazing. Let's be honest, it'd almost be like a movie. You could make it, couldn't you? Yeah. Like, going off it, if she went and, and, and won, like, like you say, lined up and won, it'd be incredible. Just imagine if all the, all the support of spectators was there as well. It just add extra, one an extra buzz. But like Tim said, when she's lined up on that on that rope and they're waiting to go, she'll be she won't be nervous. I think she'll be quite calm. She'll get the same respect, won't she? I mean the, the guys who are lining up against her, they know that she's capable. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not a different sport. In football you see women's football and you see men's football and different yeah. sports. They're in it together. That's why I, I think racing can be really proud of actually because when they yeah. line up, they're they're out to get each other. Don't yeah, get me yeah, wrong. Yeah. They want to win. Yeah. But they have equal respect they've got equal talent you know and it's well, something I think that even rachel more off the back of what rachel's done yeah yeah definitely cheltenham what she's done everyone now is looking at her thinking well ap ap mccoy sir ap mccoy legendary sir ap mccoy said that rachel changed the face of not only racing but sport because of what she was able to do competing um at cheltenham and now that now the did. chaps we thinking hang on a minute yeah we've got to get better at you yeah yeah like we're gonna, not that we're not going to be worrying about about you or wasn't before but now she's a proper contender. Every time she gets on the horse, she's going to win. And with Paul Townend injured, she's, te I think, 10 behind in the Irish Jockeys Championship, which means she could become the first ever Irish champion jockey. Could this year become the first Grand National winning rider, um, female Grand National winning rider, likely to ride Manella times. I can see that horse being one of the big gambles on the day because of the Rachel Blackmore factor. We have the Frankie factor on the flat. Rachel factor, factor on, the, on the jumps. We'll touch more on some of the other runners a little bit later on, but let's talk about your incredible career. Clearly, uh, bookmaking wasn't the route you went down in the end because you're a very talented footballer. Um, how did it all 
come about? When did you know that you were going to make it as a professional footballer? Well, it's all, all I ever wanted to do growing up as a kid, wanted to be, you know, the teachers used to say to me, what if, I always used to say, well, it's quite a negative, yeah. what if's always a very negative way of going about it. It's, it's when, it's when I'll be a player. So I was really sure that I would do it. Um, I went around a few clubs and uh, my local team was Watford. Um, and I started there as an apprentice. You know, what was your first training session like there with the first team? Oh, I can't remember the first time. I mean, it would have been with Graham Taylor, who would have been the manager, who was obviously went on to be an England manager and a very good man, playing alongside John Barnes and you know legends like that. You know, was fantastic and great experience. And I always say, you know, from my early days, you know, when I was doing the development at Tottenham, bringing them young boys through, it's okay. The coach is giving the information, but you learn so much about. It about the game on the training field and in matches with the experienced players and fantastic players. As long as you're prepared to learn, um, you learn so much off, off the experience. Like Charlie is now, I mean, he could give so much of his experience. If he's the correct type, like he is, then he could give that experience to the younger players coming through. And that, that um, information is incredible. And it was just brilliant for me, you know, to play. But I remember getting like 100 quid or something like that and taking it home and saying to my mum and dad, like, I'm getting paid to play football. I cannot believe this. You know, it's incredible. I mean, I love it. I would do it. I would pay to play and I'm getting paid to do it. And it's just brilliant. So I never set off to be a footballer because I wanted the big cars and the big house and the page free girl or whatever they motivate some now. Does that change though? Like for you, you went from non-league, bricky, odd carrier. I told you when I signed my first contract at Swindon, I was earning more money uh, working for my dad. Carrying the odd, yeah, for sure. But then, but then you, you end but up. No, you but no, that was what I was doing something that I loved. I loved it. For sure. But then when you start getting like proper, yeah. proper, no, proper. The principles money. are still there. Right. The principles of football is nothing changes, does it, Tim? Regardless, I think even but when obviously Tim play, I think the principles of football is all there. What nuts and bolts is a game has got to be hard graft. All the luxuries are there. You can go and get it. Because that's my point. Does the Tim Sherwood and the Charlie Austin, who absolutely would have would have paid to play, Come the age of 28 when you've got a big house, you've got a nice car, you've got, you know, a holiday home, golf course, whatever, you know, do you still have that same, like, childlike respect and love for the game or does that go? I think it's in you and I, and I think it obviously is a, it's a crash mat, isn't it? I mean, it helps if it all goes wrong, you know, when you've got the yeah. finances behind you, but I think too, too many of the players these days get too much too early. Now, I don't blame the clubs for giving it to them because if you don't, someone else will, but you see, see far too many of them. I mean, not the greats, the great players like the Gerrards, like the Terrys, like the Rooneys, they would play for nothing. You know, if you give them nothing a week, they would still play exactly the same way as when they were earning millions of pounds. But unfortunately, you can't say that for, for a lot of players. And they do get too much too early, get their backside wiped by the academies these days, you know, and they need to get out and play men's football as quickly as possible. Was there a player that sort of it happened in your in either of your careers that that could have you know achieved great things on the pitch but ultimately didn't have the the sort of men, mental capacity to deal with it all for me I, the only one that's well out there was Ravel Morrison I had six months with him at QPR and I just thought this guy was incredible and obviously all the rumours about him and what you heard was was all true you've got Sir Alex Ferguson saying that he was incredible talent on the field but the he said he was one of the best players he's yeah, ever Yeah, but he just said right? the off-the-field stuff was what prevented him from going on to achieve the top level. Then that's half the battle. I think the half the battle is getting the off-the-field off stuff. Because it's true what you say. If you're, all your stuff off the field's right, on the field all goes easy. I think it's a lot more difficult now with the social media as well. With these young boys, it's hard for them. You know, if they choose to do social media, they've got outside... Hard in what sense? Distractions. Well, they've got distractions. Everyone's got opinion on the game. You know, I never. I used to listen to my dad who, who knew a bit about football and I used to listen to my manager and my teammates and that was it. But now everyone's got an opinion and the, most people who go on social media and give their opinions pretty much always negative. Yeah. Um, from Watford went to Blackburn, what price did your old man have you to win the league that year? <laughs> well, not that year. I went, I, I went to Norwich first and yeah. I quickly moved on to... Uh, to Blackburn um, and it was just we were in the championship at the time got promoted that year and then um, the Premier League started 92, 93 and you know we finished fourth then second then we managed to win the league so it was a gradual but predictable step you know I, I, I wouldn't say after we finished fourth in the in the first year of the Premier League 
that I felt the dressing room expected to win the league. We absolutely never. But w the following year, when we finished second, we went into the pre-season of the 94-95 season pretty much looking at each other thinking we'll win the league. The squad was decent. Like, I mean, obviously it's a Premier League winning squad, but it was some squad, didn't he? Shearer up top, you in, in midfield, Graham Lasso, you got some proper, you had a really good sort of core to that team, didn't you? Yeah, we're a good goalkeeper. Tim Flowers was a fantastic goalkeeper. I played midfield with David Batty, who'd, who'd been around and, and really tenacious player. It's not a midfield I'd like to come yeah, up against. Yeah, and <laughs> my, 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 mate, my mate, big Leeds fan, said he's so underrated, don't get the respect. Yeah. That he deserved. No, he, was, he was he was brilliant at what he done. You know, breaking up the game and, and that mentality and drive. You know, you you look at him in the tunnel with you, and you know you got someone on your side. I mean, we had a team full of leaders. I mean, a lot of them have gone on to management, but you know, I was captain of the team, but it could have been anyone. You know, there was a lot of leaders. Colin Hendry. You know, what a player. That's a sign of a good dresser in that team, isn't it? Yeah. When you've obviously you won, but with him, but when you've got like you say, anyone could have been the captain. That's a sign of it. I mean, we had a brilliant manager as well who we respected, we looked up to because Kenny Dalglish had done it all as a player and, a, and a, as a manager previous. You know, we've been at Liverpool and then he's come to Blackburn. So we looked at him, we felt, well, he knows he's going to steer us in the right direction. None of us had won before. Uh, and he absolutely did that. He calmed us down at the right time and he fired us up at the right time. Um, but we were a group full of men and we would tell people it didn't have to be patting on the back all the time. A lot of dressing rooms now, you only hear people talk when they're patting each other on the back. It weren't like that. We, when we had to give bad news to, to each other, we did it, but we forgot about it as soon as we come out of the dressing room. That's true in a lot of industries now, isn't it? It's not just football, but everything's a bit, you know, nice. You know, there's, there's, if, if you were to get told that you were a bit shit or something was wrong, people go, whoa, 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 you've got to be a bit delicate But there. I think in football is a bubble. In that, kind, in that sense where when you cross a white line, it's three points and you want the 11 lads playing for it to get them three points, then the subs that come on, then the managers, everyone's driving for them three points. The best way is if you ain't good, I think it comes individually. If you look in the mirror and, and what you see back hasn't performed good enough, I think you know. If your teammate is giving you a little bit, sometimes that's the rocket you need. Come on, mate, you're fucking better than that. You're better than that, come on. Sometimes it's not as polite as that and it's in front of everybody. Every individual reacts differently, don't they? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Everyone, everyone reacts differently. As a captain, did you ever have to do that to that team or did that come from no, loads everybody of times. else? Loads of times, but some of the times I wouldn't be playing well myself. Yeah. But you they give know, it to you. You put yourself on you know? like I always use Matt Ritchie as a great example. I mean, he's called Steve Bruce a coward, whatever he's done. I would say to Steve Bruce, don't matter what anyone calls you, don't cut your nose off to spite your face. If Matt Ritchie is one of your best players, he proved at the weekend that he is, play him in the team. Because by digging out the manager like that, he's putting himself on offer. Now, I would have said to him, go on then, son, on you go. I know there's no crowd there, but you're under huge pressure to perform now. And what Matt did is absolutely done that, performed. Won tackles when he needed to, delivered, showed the... I mean, you see, if you could you watch that goal back again, the equaliser, when they score in the last minute, He's like heading it in like he's crossed the ball. Like, I mean, and he, was, and he sprints off down the line. Fantastic. That is what, what he's about. That's what the manager's all about. That situation, though. Listen, I, you wouldn't be happy with it. Yeah. You don't want anything, but I'd rather him talk to me than talk to the press. Someone obviously in that dressing room spoke around the side door to the press. But if we have it, we have it out, we have it out. Ain't got a problem. What you want, Charlie will tell you what you want. And in every industry, you want honesty from your boss. Now, I hate it when managers used to do it to me, used to dress it up, or if I wasn't going to play, they would tell me why, you know, and tell me these stories of why I'm not going to play. And, and I used to say, look, just tell me the truth, why am I not playing? You obviously think this one, and I know now, stepping on the other side as a manager, the manager only picks the team what he thinks is the best going to win a football match. I mean, just get on with it. But I used to have the quickest conversations ever when I was a manager. When he used to knock on my door and say, why I'm not playing, I used to give them the real reason why they're not playing. I used to say, and the only way you're going to get back in the team is if you roll your sleeves up and show me on the training pitch that you're better than the one who's got your shirt at the moment. And, and that's all they want to hear as players. You know, and it's done and dusted in two seconds. And Out you go, train well, get back in the team. And then it's your shirt and he's got a knock on my door. And that honesty, actually, Sam was pretty honest with you, wasn't he? When he came in, he said, look, you're not going to play loads, so if you want to kick yeah, on, kick on. Yeah, just said, look, you're not going to play, but if you stick around, obviously you'll be involved in the team, but if an opportunity comes, you can go. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, fine. Two days later, QPR was in and that was it. 
it was off. But honestly, it's a bit like is that in any as much football as in a bubble in any workplace you want like you say, Tim, is you want honesty from start to finish, don't you? There's no point. Don't give me no bullshit. The worst ones when you go speak to him and they say, oh, you're not going to play this week, but you're going to play next week. Well, how can you say that? Because what happens if the person that's playing in yeah. that circumstance you win four nil? Can't drop a team that wins four nil. Yeah, but it happens. Really? It, yeah, of course it does. Because sometimes they don't want to have that controversial conversation yeah. where I want to keep him happy for this week and I want to keep him happy for next week and, and all that. But ultimately, it just... That's why I like the look of Tuchel. He don't beat around the bush. I know he's got the luxury of having a load of world-class players, so he can, like, don't matter if he upsets Holly, he can bring Charlie in. You know, he's got that luxury. But I think he knows what he wants, he knows exactly what he wants, and if they don't do it like he didn't at the weekend, that was a dramatic result, that five. Getting yeah, five yeah. off West Brom. But you can have a freak result, though, right? You can have yeah, I mean, he's there. entitled to it. Yeah. I mean, they're 13 unbeaten, and 14th one come unstuck. But... It could be his job at the end of it. I mean, he's got to win the Champions League or finish in the top four. Otherwise, they are going to have a look at the position okay. as well as he's done. Of course, because it's Roman Abramovich we're talking about. You know, it's, it's that it's, it's Do you think the nature Frank didn't of the beast. have it then? Do you think Frank didn't have that at this stage of his career? I'm not saying he didn't have it. Career. I think Frank's problem, from the outside, what Tuchel's changed, what Frank didn't do, was go with a three at the back. I think the squad and the, and the players, what they've got at their disposal are far suited to playing with three. You've got, you got, you got room for a uh, lot more of them. You know, Alonso's come back into the team. Rudiger's come back in. You know, I, I think he's a good manager. I really do. I think it would be a mistake if they did get rid of him. But the nature of Chelsea Beast is, if you don't win and you don't reach your objectives, you go. The Premier League has, has been a fascinating season, actually, for, for many reasons. And now Man City have kicked clear. And the Champions League, actually, when we record this, will find out who's won and when you're listening to this, but no point us talking or preempting what's going to happen in the Champions League, is there? Uh, but what I do want to talk about is actually when I was looking back at the season where you won the Premier League yourself, Tim, it was actually on the final day, wasn't it, mm. that, um, that you managed to secure the title or sort of keep the title, if you like, because Man U drew one all and Ludic McCloskey, the, 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 the goalie, I hope I've pronounced his name That's right, it, yeah. he was unbelievable that day for West Ham, wasn't he? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he was. I mean, we sent him a crate of champagne, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> did, you yeah. did you actually? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, just, it was just immense, Ludo, on that day. And, um, you know, people, I, I hate it when I hear people, like, criticising Andy Cole, because they said, well, because he missed some chances in that game and, you know, he should have scored and he shouldn't. If it wasn't for Andy Cole, he wouldn't have been in that, in that position anyway. He scored so many goals in the build-up to that. The running, he was incredible. So... No, I think the best team in the end is the team that wins, you know, and it don't matter how close you come and how nervy it was, and it wasn't Liverpool, you know, so we're talking about down the road at Aintree, it was just at Anfield, it was fantastic, I mean, it was just, it's a blur, really, you know, and we were 12 points clear at one stage, we were a couple of games in hand, and I was obviously the captain, there was a chance to go onto that field and lift that trophy, you know, whenever that time might be. We were like hanging on like that, you know, and it looked like they were closing the gap and he, there was such a giant of a football club who knew how to get over the line and we didn't. But we managed to do it in the end, so it, was a, it all worked it's out well. It was such a proud moment for you and your, and your old man and your family, no doubt, yeah. to see you lift that trophy. I, I heard also that Blackburn turned down the chance, have you heard this? They turned down the chance to sign Zidane. Did you hear that? Yeah. Well, you come to Zidane and Dugarry the year after we won the league, come to the training ground in the <laughs> no summer. We saw them. We saw them there. How old would they have been at the time? Like oh, they'd right? been in their prime. You know, they would have been a yeah, decent player. Dugarry obviously went by the wayside. Zidane was the best player ever. You know, he was a Boy, So he was like proper... He was building up, yeah. Right. So he wouldn't have been the Zidane, but he was very good for a long time, you know. So right. he, was, uh, <laughs> he, was de he was decent, but he just weren't good enough to get into the squad at that time. <laughs> I mean, Jack Walker said, I think his quote was, why do we need Z He's obviously just turned him down. So Jack's thinking he's got the ump. So he said, why do we need Zidane when we've got Tim Sherwood? And now, Jack liked to drink, but he must have been absolutely <laughs> blottoed when he said that. <laughs> were there any players um, turned up at training or could have signed at clubs you were at that ended up going on to, to great things like that? No. Didn't I was, Messi, uh, didn't uh, no, 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 no. We know Messi didn't turn up at Burnley, mate. No, so <laughs> it's all right. Dice just cannon them off. Just, it's mad. The only one is the famous one with Peter Odom Wingy, wasn't it? I turned up for QPR. I thought he was signing for QPR, and then where, where were you at the time? Were I you was at Burnley watching it all unfold in on his the, car. And I think yeah, it was around. incredible for him, wasn't it? It's was the most bizarre thing ever. But what are you thinking when Zidane, when you're linked with Zidane? 
Did you train with him? Did you? Did he train with you on the? No, no, no. He come come to have talks. What are you there thinking? Like the... when they're coming in, are you thinking right? We I'm signed these right. two. Are we going to? Oh, is that going to be us? We go again, and that's the mistake we made because uh, we never. The team was was built on a foundation of fourth and second, and then actually winning it. But then I think that's the time when you need to strengthen. And, and that's what Fergie done brilliantly. You know, he went again, you know, and he knew the academy kids. He didn't want to block up the pathways, but he brought in a Cantona. He brought in, like, world-class players. You know, maybe just one or two. It freshens up the dressing room. I think Liverpool fell short of that a little bit. They Should've... tried there, didn't they? They had Thiago come in. Pretty much, pretty much. In. Yeah, and, they, and it's been crippled with injuries, yeah. yeah. I mean, but they, they will start next season as second favourites to win it. Yeah, of course. You know, They're I mean... Great squad, don't they? Yeah, yeah. and they'll, Van Dijk was immense, you know fantastic for him but I think you need to build you know what strike what iron's hot when are you ever going to get a chance to take some with respect to to the area of Blackburn when are you going to sign a, a Zidane to go to Blackburn yeah you know with the size of the the football club great football club fantastic close to my heart but you that's your time and you didn't do it did you think Alan was going to go on and do what he's he done I know he's, you compared him with I mean, kind of mentality there but do you think he... He's your idol, isn't he? he was yeah. the one you I was just ridiculous. I, it was, seriously, he was just laughable at times. I mean, it was just... We used to... If you put him in, you go 1v1. I mean, you you say you stand here, Alan, and whoever you wanted to pick, stand there and you race to there, he would not try a leg and he wouldn't get there in front. If you put a ball there, you could put the quickest man in the world there and Alan there, and he would beat him to that ball. He'd stick his fingers in his eyes. He gets there. <laughs> When He's all about the football. Real. He comes to life when the goal is there and the ball is the ball's in amongst them. But the dark arts, what Charlie's talking about, he find it, he found a way. He would step across people. He was just he give goalkeepers absolutely no respect. He give the, the ball respect. He always used to say contact. It's about kicking that ball. If he wants to get in the way of it, it's going to knock him out. That is the way he looked at it. He was just contact, left foot, right <laughs> foot, in the air. He just used to bully centre halves. Bully him. He used to stand behind him. I remember JT early days when he was just coming through, and he used to think he used to stand behind him when the goalkeeper's got the ball, and it was something new. And all of a sudden, he would just appear, and he was like almost catch it, get away with it because he refereed the game because of his presence. Referees were frightened to give decisions against Alan because he had such a personality, you know. So no, he was he was just incredible. But that was from the word go. Yeah, I could. I tell you, the first game we played was away at Palace. He scored two of the best goals you've ever going to see, and it was just there from now on. Because he was the one that you had the poster on the wall of when you were. Yeah, a kid, I loved him, man. And then when he growing up as a centre forward, it's. But but you, you, you are both professional footballers, you're going to laugh at this. When I watch highlight reels of Messi, Ronaldo, and like the real the Haaland to a certain extent, and I see what they do, I go, wow, incredible. Then you watch those like Alan Shearer's 150 odd whatever it is Premier League goals, and you go, yeah, like he looks great, and he's obviously a very good finisher, but he's not like. But that's different now. I see that's now. It's same as. Do you know what I'm said. trying to yeah, say? Yeah, I do. But, but I think that's the mustard. image. Like now, I think social media, ain't it? Everything now. What if you want to learn anything? Like kids growing up now, everything social media. Watch it on this. Watch on YouTube. Watch. He was deadly, man. Watching him, it was going goals, just shoot from anywhere in around that box. He just didn't care. Ball in the air, anything was just. As a kid growing up, that obviously wanted to be a striker and. It was, he was England captain. England captain, 20 goals every season. It was so just someone that you had to look up to if that's what you wanted to go on to, to be a centre forward to score goals. He was the man you had to look up to. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about like my nan would go and watch a game and if she goes and watch, well, she never went to football by the way, but I'm just <laughs> using it as an analogy. If it was Lionel Messi or Ronaldo and they're dribbling the ball and going, and she's on the end of her seat. Yeah, Whereas yeah. Alan Shearer, you ain't going to get that. Yeah, yeah. But, when you look at the paper the next day, he scored three goals and he's, like, yeah. he's assisting. That's the thing, he's like so good, but it's kind of not the like Not as pleasing on the eye, but that doesn't make them great players. It makes them two great players. Yeah. They're out, they're not world class, they're out of this world. Them two, you can't judge anyone with them two. They're out of this world. I mean, Mbappe might get somewhere near them, but Haaland's nowhere near Shearer. Really? Not at the moment, you can't even get, because he, he's, not, he's not a dribbler, he's not, he's not a messy type, great player. Fantastic at what he's doing at the moment. He's got a great opportunity to surpass what Alan's done, but he's got a long way to go at the moment. Let's turn on to your manage, managerial career um, in a moment. But before we do, Spurs, you had a, like, a lot of good players there. Why did you underachieve in that squad? Do you think? Is, and is it fair to say that you, you did underachieve a little bit given the talent you had on the on the pitch? What me? No, not you personally. Sorry, the the, the squad, Spurs. I don't think we underachieved. Really? Uh, I thought. 
I didn't think we underachieved when... when well, we well if you look at the Anderton, Sheringham, Campbell, Ginola, yourself, that's a hell of a squad and... I don't, I don't know we weren't good enough. Really? Yeah, you because know, when you look at the other teams, I would say we were all right. We were all right. But I think other teams at the time were so superior. You know, the Man United were absolutely incredible. if you look at their squad. Did you have the winning mentality? Was that at Tottenham at that time? Uh, where, where is it? Where, has it ever been there? Like, or when's it at, no, but I'm saying, you were, when you obviously was at Blackburn yeah. and you was captain, you'd, you'd had it, and Blackburn obviously gone on to... Yeah. Went. Did we, you take, try and take out Tottenham and it just weren't there? Pretty much. I mean, we had George Graham as a manager who knew how to win. I mean, yeah. he'd been at Arsenal, you know, and it was a tough job for George because he's obviously crossing over the road and managing Tottenham, and the Tottenham fans didn't want him anyway. And he was a good man. And we, we, listen, we were close so many times we were close. In the Premier League, we never got anywhere near it. We went to a couple of semi-finals, won the League Cup. So, I mean, it was minimal success. But, you, I mean, when you do read out the names, you're, you're quite right, Oli. I mean, you would have to say. But a lot of them players probably coming towards the end a little bit. I mean, I was at the back end. I went there when I was 30. So, um, Anderton was an excellent player and... Obviously, Teddy, magnificent. Gus Poirier was there at the time. Les Ferdinand. So, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight's a wonderful thing. It's just, uh, that was my era as a sort of relatively young boy growing up watching. And you, I remember that squad and I just used to think they were... Uh, Ginola, watching Ginola play football was just a joy. Like, you know, some of the stuff he used to do. Well, and then we will talk about management now with you because yeah. you managed a few clubs. Did you enjoy your time as a, man as a manager? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I... I I got the opportunity to manage Tottenham by default. Obviously, they, they decided that they wanted to part with uh, Andre Villas-Boas and Daniel Levy come to me and I was working with a development squad and he said, would I manage the team till the end of the season? And I said, yeah. I said, it was very difficult for me to go into the dressing room and get the respect if I'm not on a long contract. So, I, you know, it's like when a supply teacher comes in the door, the kids start yeah, throwing, yeah. you know, them. yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, uh, so I weren't going to have that. I said it could be a problem for for you. So um, obviously we 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 dressed it up, and um, I did it till the end of the season. And then uh, Pochettino came in, and he did a decent job. <laughs> Just a bit. Is management you want to do? I think it's two things: coaching and managing. I think it's two things. Like you have the coaching good on the grass. I think managers more now is, is you've got to manage people. That's I think you got to manage people. Manage especially how many nationalities and stuff you have in the team, everybody's different. It's no longer that the English core is, it's no, everyone buys into what it is. Everyone has their own different ideas, especially when they're coming from different cultures and that, I think that's quite tough. So for me, being a manager, yeah, it'd be great, but the coaching side, I just don't see myself doing that. It's really changed management and management back in the day when, we, when I was a player, you used to have to adapt to the manager. Now the manager has to adapt to the different personalities. And the personalities, not they were all exactly the same, but they're all players similar. Players or people above? No, well, that as well. But players in the dressing room, which is most important. You've got to get the best out. A good manager gets the best out of the, of the squad he's got. Now, to be able to do that, I think now as a manager, with just so many diverse personalities, nationalities, I think you have to adapt to them individuals. And if you don't, Unless you've got the best squad in, in the league, I think you come unstuck. Do you think Jose is getting the best out of, of Spurs at the moment? I think it's a fine margins with, with Tottenham, with Jose, because if they do finish, when they've still got a chance to finish in the top four and they win the Carabao Cup, that is the best season Tottenham have had for a very, very long time. Now, if they finish where they are in the league now, six, and they're out of Europe, and there's no Europa League, so there's no Champions League, no Europa League, and they don't win the Carabao Cup. It's not a very good season. What, what I find fascinating, I read that comment where they said, like, oh, you're, you've, you've thrown away a lot of winning positions this season. He goes, um, same manager, different players. Mm. If you're a player in that dressing room, Chaz, are you not just going, you absolute tool? Like, why are you throwing us under a bus? You, you talk that's about what comes with Jose. Yeah, stuff, but I think but... that's what comes with Jose, and that's what sometimes he, he manages the dressing room and takes all the pressure on him. Sometimes he has no worries about chucking it straight on you. But I think as a group of individuals, and, and it depends obviously how strong Tottenham it, the squad is, I think they'll all look around and think, they'd know they ain't getting, they're underachieving. At, as we speak at the moment, they're underachieving, because it says that in the, the league table. Imagine, can you imagine Tottenham next year, fans back in, no European football? It'd be a disaster yeah, for the football also, club. 
no, potentially no cane. But that's what I'm saying. No the, European the, the effects football. of it comes on. But I'm saying in the dressing room now, they'll be thinking, we can't allow this to happen. Because if we lose Harry Kane, this squad could go all over the shop. Mm. And I think that's what, it come, that's what it actually all comes down to. It does. Harry Kane is the nucleus of that football team, the nucleus of that whole football club. I think Jose's got a different, obviously, a style Brilliant. of management. Do you rate him as well, a manager? Got, you can only rate him. Sorry, do you rate him now as a manager? Do you well, think he's still as good I, I, as he I, I, was? Well, or has that aura diminished? It remains to be seen. Like I say, if he does achieve this season, finishes in the top four, that is the objective of Daniel Levy when they brought him in. Minimum requirement, top four. He's still got a chance to do that. If he does that and he wins the Carabao Cup and gives him silverware, I think he's had a magnificent season. They had a real chance to win Europa League and they blew it. And in the same week, that emotional game in the North London derby where Arsenal controlled them. The only saving grace at the moment for Tottenham and Tottenham fans is Arsenal so bad. It's a really key point, isn't it, in the season for Tottenham, as you say, because oh, it can go one doors, or two ways. Yeah. It's like a toss of a coin job. North London derby, though, because you've touched on it a couple of times. Is that for you the match that you will always remember as, as the match in your career? Always. Oh, I dreamed about playing in North London derby, you know, when I was a kid, because like I say, it was red or white. Um, it was brilliant, you know. My dad still goes to the Emirates. He went to Highbury. He, 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 he took me to Highbury when I was a kid. He, I remember scoring a winner for Tottenham in 99. And when I went up to the players' lounge after, I thought someone had died. When I saw my dad, he was just distraught. You know, it was almost like, oh, well done, that was good, wasn't it? He, he knew he had to say that, but it, it means that much to him. You know, oh, what, he's that, an Arsenal fan? Yeah. Oh, I thought he was a Spurs fan. I'm no. going, why is he... No, wow, awesome, oh, he would have hated awesome you. <clears throat> well, because I was because I scored the winner. Yeah, yeah. He knew that it was. He, you know, it was half pleased for me, but he was <laughs> obviously very do. disappointed with the result. So uh, no, it is the big game. It's the it's the game where everyone looks out for. Well, certainly I did. I was, well, you know, when I went to Tottenham, it was like, well, when do we play Arsenal? Hopefully, we got them again. Um, even though most of the time when I was a player, he took a good eye in off them. Yeah. Um, do you think that that derby has lost a bit of it? Yeah, well, obviously because of the, I think it's because of the foreign influence right. of the, the players. Shame do, that, isn't it? Do, yeah, but it's a shame all over. Yeah. You know, I think every derby would be exactly the same, not only in North London derby. Well, who's QPR's rivals? Brentford and uh, they've won in there, but it has. Has that got spice to it? I don't think so. Not with the, the foreign, the way Brentford mould Brentford are going at the moment, I don't. They just see QPR as one of them, but. I think that works more in QPR's favour than what it does the other way. But that, that's that's football. That's the direction it's going. But I think what we talk about your management, I'd like Aston Villa. You know, when you went in there, and we've did Jack have that? You know, when you said Harry had the that desire and the determination, the mentality there. Did Jack have very similar then at your age? Different. He different, was different. Different. He just had raw ability, like you would not believe. I remember going and watching him play. Uh, he was 16, he was playing in the under 18s at Bodymore Heath, which is the training ground of, of Villa. And I was working with Harry at Tottenham. So I used to watch the first team for Harry up the top and I used to come down half time, we had a little, have a little meet and see what I saw. But I remember going there in the morning and thinking, I want to go because I want to see this kid Grealish play. He was playing against our under 18s. And he didn't disappoint me and I, and I remember thinking oh, I would just love to be working with this kid. So I remember saying to Harry that we had a first, I won't mention the player's name, we had a player who Villa wanted for their first team and he wasn't playing at Tottenham so I remember saying let's get rid of him. Get rid of him and say you give us Grealish and we'll do a part X now. I said this kid is, but, and, but Harry was absolutely right and he, he could have experienced. Greenish weren't going to help him out then. And by the time Greenish was ready to produce, Harry would not have been there, or no manager would, you know, unless you were Wenger, like with a 10 year stint or whatever. So it just don't happen. So you learn along the way, and Harry's absolutely right. He weren't going to offer him nothing, and he might have to use the boy who I was talking about, who was an established player who played international football. But I knew Jack was special. So when I went in there, I was thinking, right, how am I going to structure the team? to get the best out of Ben Teke, who was our only goal scoring threat really, and find a route for this kid, Grealish. And it was it was just moving it around and, and we managed to do all right, do you know what I mean? At your expense. You yeah. scored against us, didn't you? Yeah, three, three, three. yeah. Ben Teke's got a ben, hat-trick, ben Teke got a hat-trick. Well, he was unbelievable for me. Ben Teke. He scored 13 goals in 11 games. Can you understand why it hasn't worked for him? Yeah, because I think that People have tried to be a little bit too sophisticated with him. Yeah. He 
His strengths are get the ball in the box, and he is so powerful. He's I've not seen. Shearer was very good in the yeah. air. Les was obviously very good in the yeah, air. Yeah, Les Ferdinand. This boy comes very close to them, but get him in the box. He started coming off and wanting to be a number ten when he went to Liverpool and all that. And I remember saying to Brendan, trying to put him off as much as I could because they met the buyout clause, and I knew if he went, it was impossible for us to for whatever they got for him, 32 million was a lot of money at that time. And I remember Brendan saying, we're gonna buy, buy him out. I was trying my best to put him off him because I knew I needed him because I didn't want him to sign anyone because they kept wanting to sign different players from the French league primarily. And I, I remember saying to him, let me keep this squad of players, I'll keep in the league next year, if that's the objective. It should be higher than that for a club like Villa. But if that's your objective, do not sell anyone, make sure Christian stays and I'll keep you in the league again. But they, a few of them moved on. Fabian Delph, Ron Villar, uh, Tom Cleverley, um, and Christian Benteke. That is the core. That That's is, your core squad. I, I used to say, you know, I'll put the decorations on a tree, but give me the tree first. And they took the tree away. So yeah. it's almost impossible. Just left with a bauble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, Villa's obviously doing pretty well now. Um, they were a team that, that obviously you, you were talking about they, but, that you managed, but Dean and, and JT, they're doing a good good job there. And, and Jack, obviously, he's injured at the moment, but a lot's being talked about right now about the England squad going to the Euros and the England team. I've heard you talk about it. Can I just, and you might need a little bit of time to think about it, but who would be your England teams if you were picking a match on Saturday, Grand National Saturday, and England were playing, who would you have as, as your team? Or, or who, who would be notable omissions, perhaps, rather than telling us? Uh... When I did mine, this must have been about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, I actually left Mason Mount out. Right. And since, Changed your mind? Yeah. I think I just, on a personal, I just didn't give him the credit that he thoroughly deserved. Mm. And he'd be in, he definitely. Who's Greedish in your team? Yeah. I, I had, yeah. And I went with, I went 4 1 3 2. I don't think we need two sitters. I don't, I don't think we need to. I think we've got so much creativity in the team. In, in well, so you wouldn't have Declan and Calvin? Or Jordan Henderson. Out of, I would only have, have one, one of them. One. Only the one. Yeah, I think we've got so much creativity in the team. I think we've got to take it to, we've got to, take it to teams. Tournament football, we've got to go and win games. No, we want to get off the edge of our seats. In 2018, the whole country was on the edge of our seats because we actually thought we was going to win. And the excitement was there. The goal scorer, the main thing. We're constantly going forward and, and beating teams. I think we need to just continue ne to Gary do that. Neville made an interesting point there on Monday night. He said 96, which is arguably the best sort of English tournament. Obviously, we've had the World Cup since. But, um, but he said Scotland battered them, Spain battered them, Holland had like 70% possession. They didn't go and do that, even though they won 4-1 or whatever it was against Holland. Tournament football is about winning games, however you, you win. Would you have an attacking influence on the England I side? I think you have to. If you, if you looked at the, some of the biggest clubs, and I know the pandemic's paid the price financially to the Madrid's and the Munich's and the Barcelona's of this world, but if you said to them, take your pick out of the English players, they're not taking any of our centre halves. They're probably taking none of our fullbacks. They're taking all of our number 10s and they're taking our strikers. So play to your strengths. I'm not sure. The goalkeeper's top draw. Um, which one he chooses, I don't know. Um, I think at the moment, if you'd have to pick, you'd go Maguire and Stones because I think Stones has earned the right. Carl Walker for experience, pace, power. You wouldn't have Trent. I would. Trent's a difficult one. I think he, he can't do no more than what he did at the weekend after being left out of the England squad. I mean, he showed the manager. He said, like, I'm showing you what I can do. But that is what he can do in the final third. When he, he's been left wanting, when he's had to defend. Now, if he wants to play with a three, Gareth, then you'd have Trent. If he wants to play with a four, I think you have Walker. Yeah. And uh, on the other side, it's the toss of a coin. But I think Luke Shaw's done enough to get in there. I think he's there's the head he's of. He's another one who's answered Chilwell. his critics. I've been so impressed by yeah. this. Yeah. But like, I'm with Charlie. When he talks about Mason Mount, I was like that with Declan Rice. Yeah. I was like, I'm not sure he's an international player. I'm absolutely convinced he's an international player now because I've seen him throughout. He's developed throughout the season. You don't think a Madrid or a Barcelona would, would want someone like Declan as that sort of like... Possibly, the, the yeah, possibly now. He's sort of moving into that Because he's got that drive now. He, he, he sees a hole and he drives the ball forward and he's a great athlete and he runs and he's... What managers want is a, play, a lot of players where they can put his head on the pillar at night, night before the game, and this kid, kid ain't going to wake him up. Declan's never waking you up in the middle of the night. Charlie Austin might. <laughs> With voice notes. <laughs> Scored again. <laughs> what about me? Yeah, yeah. Morning, Morning again. Complete the team then. 
just finish your, your England team? I don't know. I, I'd have to. Have Would you have Grealish? Raheem has to play because of his goal threat. Obviously, Harry Kane has to play. I would play Grealish and I would find room for Foden and Mount within it. I'll tell you what, there will be lots of people talking this week about the Grand National and who's, who their fancy is, but then it will turn, won't it, to, um, to who Gareth Southgate should pick. But fingers crossed we, we have a good run in that. Um, time for the studs up hat trick now, um, which we ask all our guests to do. Three questions, left foot, right foot and a header. Um, the perfect hat trick. And the first question that we always ask our guests is, who was the biggest influence in your career, Tim? I would have to say my, my old man, you know, it's like, um, you know, when they, they give up so much of their time, um, I, the clubs now, I mean, they pick the kids up, they take them, they do them back, they feed them, they do all that. But my mum and dad had to do that for me, you know, and, and you appreciate that. And, and Charlie would, would vouch for this. And his granddad, and, you know, they pay a lot of, you know, a big, big part of your career. So it, it, there's other people along the way, but I'd have to say that you can't look further than your family. Uh, what about the best player you've, you've worked with? Oh, played. Oh, sure. Let's do played and let's do managed Sh- as well. Sh- played Sh- with? Sure. Sh- 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 there's been good ones. And yeah, I'm, listen, I'm not even apologising to the ones who are not going to be at the top because he's so good. I've got a Premier League medal and he's the reason why I got it. <laughs> It is, and I just—I know we constantly gone. Who's the best striker in the Premier League? Who's the best striker we ever seen? This guy scored 260 goals. Like Henri got you off your seat. Yeah. But he didn't score 260 Premier League goals. Yeah. That, that's for me. I always say he's the best. He's, he's not a bad. Um, he's not a bad golfer as well. He owned a horse. Do you remember Augusta Kate? I think um, they named it because they took a trip to the Masters, and obviously it's the Masters week as well. We'll talk about the golf in a moment, but um, he loves his racing as well, Alan. Um, He's got a lot of airtime on his podcast this week. I hope he's listening because he's got a lot of praise as well. And finally, to complete the hat trick, what's been the most embarrassing moment in your career, would you say? I would probably say, and it is, I don't really like to think about it too much, is the FA Cup final when I managed Villa. Semi-final when we, we beat Liverpool was such a great occasion. And to get beat heavily in the final by Arsenal was a real downer, you know. You said after that, didn't you? I've got a quote here. said it was probably the, fir- the worst thing we could have done. What did you mean by that? That was probably the season, the season on. The season yeah, on yeah. from that. Because uh, false expectation for the, for the owners. We shouldn't be nowhere near a cup final. Right. You know, I think Southampton might go to the cup final this year. That is like, it, it's not as bad. We were struggling at the bottom of the league. We survived in the Premier League and got to the cup final and beat Liverpool. We were fantastic along the way. So it almost gives them false hope. False hope, the thinking, well, they're not, can't be that bad, you know, because you're in the cup final. I think sometimes it pays. Like Arsenal have done it with Mikel. Yeah. You know, he's got that cup. He won the trophy. You know, he's in there ringing the, ringing the bell. He's won the trophy. And all of a sudden, they're looking at the squad. But he, he knows. He's saying, this ain't good. They ain't good enough. If you want a challenge for the Premier League, they're nowhere near it. But it gives them false hope. Thank you for that. A perfect hat trick. How many hat tricks have you scored in your career, by the way? Four, five. I don't. Don't look at me like I know the answer. Five. <laughs> <laughs> five, the answer. five. Do you keep all the balls in at home? Are they in the box? Uh, I've them? got. Mum's got four, and I've got the Premier League one at home. Yeah. Also, I noticed as well. We asked you to bring one of your man of the match. Didn't you have a few Premier League man of the match trophies? Yeah, I went for. A, went for you didn't trust us, did you? I didn't get asked to bring them once. <laughs> so I was just didn't asked to bring the Sky Bet one. Happy days. Well, Tim, it's been fascinating reflecting on your career. We're going to turn our attentions back, though, now to the, to the Grand National. Let's turn our attentions to the world's most famous race, which is coming up live on Saturday at 5.15, live from Aintree. And we can hear now from one of the leading players in the race. He's a Studs Up regular, I think it's fair to say, having appeared on an earlier edition of Studs Up. It is time once again to check in with Daryl Jacob, who's very much looking forward to getting back on the grey Bristol de May. And not only did you ride a grey to victory, with Neptune, Daryl. You're also on a grey this year and a horse that you absolutely love. Before we talk about Bristol Domain's chances, just take us back to that that thrilling win on Neptune Colonge. How much did that win change your life? Yeah, good morning, Ollie. Um, yeah, no, it was um, it was a, an unbelievable. Um, it was a life changer, really. I mean, obviously, every jockey gets into into racing. Um, you know, wants to be involved in the Grand National, and uh, you know, I've been very, very lucky. Um, over the years that I've had uh, plenty of rides in the Grand National but you know to you know to say you've actually won it when people ask you you know about the Grand National about being a jockey 
you know, the the first thing they'll ask you, you know, have you ever have you ever ridden in the Grand National or have you ever won the Grand National? And uh, you know, you can say, you know, you have won the Grand National. So it's uh, you know, it, it it was an unbelievable day. It was an unbelievable feeling, and uh, you know, it was uh, it was very very exceptional. I I imagine having having done it, you want it again and. In Bristol, um, Demaya, a horse you absolutely adore. Do you think you've got a good chance of doing it again? I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, he's got a, a similar sort of a, a profile, hasn't he, to Neptune? I mean, since I won the race in Neptune, he's been the sort of the classiest horse I've ridden in the race. Um, you know, Neptune had, um, you know, he had Gold Cup plays for him, so has Bristol. You know, and Neptune, I suppose, was probably unlucky. Um, you know, in his his era, he was around, you know, Denman and Cato Star, and he probably would have won more grade ones if it wasn't for them two horses. But, you know, Bristol's, he's he's won seven grade ones. Um, he's been placed in a Gold Cup. Um, he's a very, very classy horse. Um, you know, and he's, he, he, like you say, he's, he. I, I think going in there, I think he's got a massive chance. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really excited about him. And, and just tell us, there'll be lots of people who are listening and watching Studs Up this week who, who might be new to the Grand National or only watch racing once a year. Um, you say you got nervous schooling him there. What are you like, even though you've won the race on the day of the race? Are you a, a someone who gets nervous? Is there lots of nerves in the weighing room that day? Uh, yeah, it's a different sort of weighing room, um, Grand National day to, to your normal day. You know, everyone's obviously very, very excited. Everyone's, you know, got a lot of energy. Um you know, and you just got to try and con- contain that, you know, the excitement of riding in the Grand National or being involved in the Grand National Day itself. It's it's a u- unique experience. And, um, you know, some people will handle it differently. Like you can see like quite a, a lot of people that are quite loud during the week and stuff like that, and they'll go very, very quiet. And then you will obviously see the reverse angle of that as well. So, um, you know, you, different personalities definitely come out on, on, on Grash- Grand National Day. And we heard that great story when you were a guest with us on Studs Up about you and Sammy talking in a in a race at Ludlow. I, I absolutely love it. But in the Grand National, <laughs> it's over four and a half miles, so you've got loads of time. Um, is there much communication amongst the jockeys about positioning and, and things like that? There's a lot of screaming, that, if you wanted to know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, it, it's... Like I say, it's you, you know obviously it's 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 a, a very very high profile race and um, but look when you're out there too you know yeah we're in the game for the lover and for for the for the crack as well and like you say you do try to have as much as you can you know especially over you know for the first three miles and stuff like that you will talk to other jockeys you will have a bit of banter but with other jockeys like how are you jumping and you know when a jockey beside you hits a fence hard and stuff like that you will have a bit of banter but you know getting down to the serious end of the race when you know in the last sort of in the last mile the last three quarters of a mile then it's it's very much you know every jockey for himself there's no inch given and uh, you, you've got to be really you've got to be really zoned into what you're doing. So Daryl Jacob hoping once again to steer a grey to Grand National glory and uh, not many greys have won not many top weights have won and indeed, as Tim said at the top of the, uh, the podcast this week, it is a lottery. The first horse ever to win the Grand National was called Lottery, but Bristol de May has been such a great horse for Daryl. And it's become a race where the classier horse, Charlie, has got a great chance. And I think Bristol de May, arguably, is the best horse in the race in terms of natural talent. Yeah, you can say that. Obviously, it's there, but ultimately, it comes down to the weights, don't it? Mm. Um, do you think it's too much? I do, to carry? yeah. I do. I think it's too much. It's a grade one winning horse. Constantly, I just feel that the favourite Tremor Hammond's horse is going to take a hell of a stop and you know what I mean? It's one of those this year where you're sort of desperately looking for Somewhere a else. horse to take him on with. Yeah. And yet you always just come back and go, he's £14 well in cloth cap. He's, if it was a normal race, it'd be a stone higher. He likes quick ground. You know he stays. He races on speed so he shouldn't have all the sort of carnage in behind. Like... It's almost too good to be true, do you know what I mean? I'm sort of trying to find a way to get him beat and I keep going, I can't really. Do you know what I mean? Anything to, to take him on with? I mean, any second now is trained by Ted Walsh, who's won the race with Pappy on a few years ago. Now, he's a horse that lots of people are tipping up against Cloth Cap and obviously Ted knows what it takes to win the race. Take Cloth Cap out of it, it's a better race, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it, and it's a much more interesting betting heat as yeah. well in many ways. Because it's ten to one the field, then, isn't it? Well, that's what I mean. But then, even if you have Ty- if Tiger Roll ran, yeah, would Tiger Roll be favourite if he was running in it? I don't think he would. No, yet. But that's what I'm saying. Would he not? 
Are well of cloth caps? I, I think if you're saying he's stone, be, he's a stone well in. Five's do you know what I mean? So the shrewd joints. punters are going to be back in cloth cap, aren't they? Let's be honest. Mm. The shrewd punters, it wouldn't surprise me if he goes off shorter. And that sounds mental yeah. for, a, for a Grand National, doesn't it? But it wouldn't surprise me if he goes off shorter. Yeah, I think you might be right. You know, I think, like, like you said, I think professional punters might go this... This just four to one is silly about all these. They could just go as buy money. Yeah. Especially if all the. But then you know he'll fall at the first uh, yeah, and everyone goes, well, it's a grand there you go. National like the safe, now it's a lot, obviously a lot different, the fences yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Not a lot there to go wrong. Was it McCoy on Clam Royal? It was, no, well, McCoy, did, McCoy rode in one year and then Liam Cooper rode in the other year. Yeah, but what was the one where McCoy, McCoy was, was on Clam and got took, o- took yeah. off, didn't he? That's not really. So yeah, I don't know whether you remember that, but McCoy was travelling. He'd never won the Grand National before, and he, I mean, he was as good as going to win it, and a loose horse just ran right in front of him before Beaches. But that doesn't happen now. So no. Cloth Cap, if he's out in front, it's, it's not going to happen. But then there are, look, there are big, powerful yards and horses represented. Jig and Stown have got a load, the owners of Tiger Roll still. JP McManus has got five or six in the race. You've obviously got Cloth Cap, but we, we still have, as we've touched on already, the story horses like Manella Times for Rachel, Yalarenki for Bryony Frost, Sub Lieutenant for Tabitha Worsley. And then you've got Potter's Corner, who won the virtual Grand National last year and is owned by John Davies, the Welsh centre, who's won the Six Nations recently. Now, he's not out of it for Wales, I don't think, Chaz. I think he's got a decent chance. Yeah, he's got a good chance, of course. And again, he's going to have everyone behind him. He wins a virtual one. He must have been buzzing at home. That was the most watched race of 2020, like unsurprisingly, but there was no racing for three months. But I think about 8 million people watched the virtual race. But that's what I mean. I think that just shows how important the race is to a, yeah. to a lot of people. Everyone's brought up around it was either the FA Cup final, mm-hmm. the, the Grand National. Everyone's buzzes off it. I think he's got a great chance for the Welsh. Um, but, mate, I, I just can't get away from the favourite. I really can't. Do you think, as sportsmen in a different sport, that the Grand National still holds that place in the British public's heart, I guess? Do you still think it is the race that everyone who doesn't like sport goes? Oh, absolutely. Oh, Tim, have you, you know, who have you got on the National? Yeah, I mean, for, in my house, I mean, no one's interested in horse racing apart from me. Um, I go, I go Ascot, I go Cheltenham, I go Windsor on Monday nights. Do you? Yeah, it's good fun there. It's really good. We go, yeah. we drive to Windsor, we get the boat in. Do you? you know, it's great. Oh, the kids magic, love it. Yeah, yeah. And my my youngest is really interested in horses, but not race horses. So um, it's amazing. But they will be watching on at the weekend. You know, the kids will be watching. We have a sweepstake, and they'll be watching the race. And, that, and I think that's common in every household. And I think it's also if same as the bookies, isn't it? Do you know the high street bookmakers? Even once, if you everything's online now, but the booking the booking shops. Are, Buzzing. It's, the buzz is definitely there and it, everyone wants to, the sweepstake, especially when you have the work sweepstake, start looking at what you've got and then yeah. you pick that out and you back it again. Yeah. I, ser- I certainly yeah. do anyway. You're going to have about 10 bets. Your, your kids' birthdays, I have cloth t- cap, Kids, kids the birthdays, cloth for. cap, the sweepstake. Yeah. That's even before we got on the yeah. Masters, mate. So by the time I'm going to find the winner somehow. Yeah. I'm going to have to. You'll have to sell those nice new trainers. To oh, no, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other horses that we're going to um, discuss now is Vieux on Rouge. She's actually, believe it or not, got the most successful record of any horse in the history of horse racing, jumping the Grand National fences, because he's jumped 232 Grand National fences, and not once has he made a mistake. We can hear now from his trainer, David Pike. David, there will be people up and down the country who are picking out names out of hats for sweepstakes and what have you. And I suppose if they pick your horse out, Vieux Leon Rouge, um, I don't want to put the mockers on it, but they'll know that this is a horse that absolutely loves entry in the Grand National fences. Yeah, I mean, he lights up to the uh, lights up to the occasion. Uh, he's been an amazing horse around these fences. And uh, if they pick him out, I'm sure they'll get a run for his money. Uh, unfortunately, the trick does uh, probably seem a little bit too far for him, but uh, I don't know, he's in very good form at home and um, Colour and Farrell's going to ride him um, and uh, we hope for a good run again. He's, uh, he's jumped 232 national fences without mishap in a race and he won the beach of chase this year, he's won that race before as, as well. What, what is it about the, the challenge, the test that seems to bring out the best in him? Uh, I wish I knew. Uh, as, as we said, he jumps those fences better than the park fences. I mean, he's a very inquisitive horse. Um, you know, he, he knows when he gets to entry that um, it's the special day. Um, you know, he loves it. Obviously, he won the beach, as you said, this year. He's won it twice. Um, he, he's very accurate over those fences, and uh, he eyes them up. And, uh, you know, he must be a dream ride for, for a jockey. Uh- 
Cross Cat will be ridden by your regular jockey, your stable jockey, Tom Scudamore. I, I know that obviously you'll be cheering Gurley on Rouge on, but if, if Gurley on Rouge wasn't to win, um, how proud would you be of, of Tom if he was able to win on Cross Cat? Well, yeah, no, very proud. I mean, he's um, the ultimate professional, and uh, his father uh, never won the Grand National. Um, so it would be a, a feather in his cap, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, as I say, he's got all the right credentials, the, the, the horse and the jockey. Uh, Scoo's got a good track record around there, um, so I'm sure he's very much looking forward to it. And so nice, actually, there that David would be really proud if, um, if Scoo was to win the Grand National, even though he's not riding his horse. And I guess you as a manager, if a player like, I suppose, you probably get pride seeing what Harry's done or Jack's done mm. now, I guess. Yeah, you do. It's, it's not, when you develop players, it's not about them winning trophies, it's about seeing them as individuals, you know, moving forward and playing captain in England is a really proud moment for someone who's had a small part of his development. Yeah, and um, Scoo's like a really popular guy in the weighing room. He's obviously had a few goes at it. His grandfather won it in 59, his dad never did, but... Yeah, mate, they love him. I see him quite a bit when I go up to... He rides out at Richard Hannon sometimes as yeah. well, do you know what I mean? So he's puts in the hard yards. Yeah, nice fella. Really nice guy, yeah. Um, OK, then, come on. I want a Grand National tip, but I think, actually, there's not much point in asking because I think we're, <laughs> we're probably all going to tip the favourite here. Do you have any uh, big price that you fancy? No. No? <laughs> Cloth cap? <laughs> Well, you can both wear this. I'll go cloth cap and I, and I would go if, if he gets introduced into the race, Bo Bay, but only from name. Yeah, exactly. Any names? What are the numbers we need to look out for? What are the 15, Pittsburgh? 11, 15. 11 and 15. Um, well, I'm going to give a few, a few horses to keep an eye on at a price. I actually do think sub-lieutenant Tabitha's ride is way too big a price because this horse finished fourth in a grade one at Aintree, second in a grade one at Aintree, second in a topham over the national fences. And if it was trained by someone who was a more well-known name would be much, much shorter. So I actually think sub-lieutenant will run well. I think any second now is going to go pretty close to the favourite. And Disco Rama is a horse that I actually really fancy in the race. I'll be backing Disco Rama for Paul Nolan and Brian Cooper, who had festival success with Mrs Milner. Uh, nearly won the Irish Grand National with latest exhibition, but I think Disco Rama, he definitely stays. He's a, he's a talented horse. So those would be my, with cloth cap, my Grand National 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, Skybet will no doubt be offering lots of attractive deals on the day and you can check the best prices and what have you with our good friends at Odds Checker. So make sure you get involved with the, uh, the Grand National. Now we should just talk about the golf as well because not only, I mean this for me is hands down my favourite week of the year. Mm. Golf and Grand National. Uh, Augusta, are you a big golfer? Yeah, I love golf. Love what do it. you play off? I play off six. Bloody hell. He won't be joining us then, will yeah. we? We'll hold you up, Tim. What yeah. do you mean, you play off eight? Yeah, true. But and, yeah. And I'm trying to get a few shots out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and Augusta, will you be watching? Yeah, brilliant. Shot? Brilliant. And uh, I've, I've seen a, the guys practising there and the greens look like they're lightning yeah. quick. So, as always, but I think Jordan Spieth just hit form at the right time. You know, he loves this place. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I would, I would be betting him. You know, I, is I, he your fancy in it? I just think he is. I think... Golf has come in streaks, you know. We saw Molinari when he when he won at, uh, in the PGA at Wentworth, and then he he went and cleaned up, didn't he? After that, and win the Masters. But I think that Spieth knows how to win, you know. And I, and I just think that he's on a high at the moment. So yeah, I'll be looking at him. His form is phenomenal right now. I know he obviously got the win in the Valero the other day. Last and that's the thing, putting is phenomenal. The last six weeks, or last eight weeks of his form. But confidence must, for you guys as well, when you, if you went through a bad dip, would, would it affect games for two, three, four weeks, even months, would you say? Different though with us, because it's team sport, you've got someone to lean on, didn't you? You can, you can hide almost, you know, and I've, I've had some of the worst spells ever playing-wise and scored a goal and, you know, you get the, the headlines on the back of the paper and all of a sudden you're out of that. You're out of the hole, you're as in, you know, and the confidence comes back and you needed other people to do that. Well, they're out there on their own, you know, and, and, but he knows course and distance. This kid knows how yeah. to win, you know, he's like... He a, should have won a few more. Monsters, yeah, actually, and he's caddy. I, mean, I would hate to be his caddy. Yeah, he talks so it. much. <laughs> I'm just saying, shut up, hit the yeah. fucking ball. You know what I mean? I like, just want to see, I want to see Bryson play there. I think last year he came and showed it no respect. Yeah. And he killed himself in the press conference. No one wanted him to do well when he said he was going to shoot. Yeah. He, he said par around there with 67. Yeah, yeah that's what he said. Because he said he can reach every... And then he killed it. And so when he went in the trees off the first par five, everyone was wanted him to fail, didn't they? Mm. I just think, I'd just love to see him just 
Me too. Smash it about. He's changing golf, but for the good thing, you see Lee Westwood, is it for two weeks on the bounce when they were both playing the end groups? And he's like, well, look at this guy. I'm 40, 48, still battling on same. Yeah. He says, I think it's brilliant for the golf. I'll tell you what's also good. Not only does he bang it 380 yards, but then a couple of times he's just hit one about 40 yards. Yeah. You know, he's like topped the ball, tried to drill it and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of times he's just he's nobbled it off what done. everyone done. So you kind of think, yeah, they're human also. What I found really interesting was what McElroy said, because he said, look, I'm, my driver's all over the gaff because I'm, I'm trying to copy what Bryson does. I'm trying to absolutely smoke it. And like, he's making other players do things that they don't want to do to try and match him, which I, I find fascinating. Do you think McElroy could do anything, Augustine? I think Rory's so good that he could do it at any given time, but I think that he's putting so much pressure on himself to win this one. You know, and I, and I think that that does take its toll. You know, if, if there's any European for me to, to win it, I would go with someone who I know very well who's got the mentality to be able to win this tournament, which is Tyrrell Hatton. Is he, is he a nice fella, Tyrrell? Yeah. You know why I like him? Because he don't try and be anyone different and he don't try and be anyone's mate. Yeah. Um, he's there to win, you know, and off, off the course he's like a diamond of a fella, you know, but he's, you know, he's not there to be an actor and to make everyone like him for different reasons he, he is what he is and uh, he's a winner it'd be great to see him win um, could, will McElroy be in your squad that you're backing or not no not this time no, who, say, who are you signing with I'm going Patrick Cantley only because <laughs> I, honestly, this, you'll like this I come home from, from, the, ga for I come home from the game <laughs> on Monday <laughs> put a chance there's a golf masters on there looking they're doing, obviously they're doing a press conference they're the first person on there Patrick Cantlay what you'll do for me <laughs> you're, you're do, you're do for me I ain't got a clue what he's been up to last four or five weeks could be having a stinker might have missed every cut he was the first one I see for I'm on I like him he does, he's got a good game but he's not the most interesting guy in the world <laughs> no, he was boring don't yeah. he was the first one I see <laughs> pace into five seconds bop there is a theory though when you drive to the races if you see a trainer jockey or lorry when you're driving in you should back whoever the sort of person you see the first person you see is so that's the theory um sky bear are paying 11 places in the uh, in the augusta masters augusta masters the masters at augusta uh, so make sure you get involved so cantlay spieth who will i decide i think paul casey could go well actually he's pretty solid isn't he um were there any games when you you talk about sort of um being informed but then the pressure that rory puts on himself were there ever games that you either of you played where the pressure got to you for whatever reason, where it just got too much and you just didn't perform how you'd want it? No, I, I, not for me. I think there was games when I didn't play well, but I don't think it was due to pressure. It's just a, we were out of form. Um, and you, you'd normally look to the side of you and hopefully someone gets you out of jail, but you know, a few occasions they don't and you end up having a stinker. And, and if you're in a good team and a good squad of players, you end up sitting on the bench for a few games. Yeah, what about you? Uh, I think with the football like you say it's a team sport and you're always looking for the other one aren't you? but I think as a player you want the pressure mm. I think you invite a lot of people want to grab all the pressure and think it's like penalties centre forwards I think all the centre forwards should take because the pressure's there I'll take it would you always put your hand up for a yeah let me take it because you've just won it you're the goal scorer that's what you're there because mm. the, the, the ten lads that are behind you are looking at you to be the man to to score the goals. I suppose as a captain as well, when you're at Blackburn, if there was a penalty shooter, you probably can't duck away and go, oh, you know, you But then he's got, he's got you. Alan Shearer there, who he knows, <laughs> boss, oh, 100%. Yeah, he's right. putting the pressure on him, but he knows 100%, yeah, that's my man. Yeah. I think uh, the best penalty takers are the ones who forget about it by the time they come out of the penalty box. Yeah. You know, if they miss. Yeah. You know, they don't care if they miss. <laughs> you know, and that's the best penalty taker, because they're cold, you know, they're, they're on it. Not that they don't care, it's just that they think it's part of the game. Nothing you know? annoys me more as a fan though, watching them do those like sort of like swaggers up to it, one yeah. steps and then miss it. It's all it fashionable now. Yeah. Football's turned all fashionable. There's nothing wrong running up three, mind step, you, three four the steps and blasting. When you look at Fernandez, he never looks like he's going to miss and he does that. He yeah. does a stutter, doesn't he? You know, I mean, he's, like, he's, well, he's missed one pen. Yeah. Jorginho is another good penalty he taker who does a blip, that. Though, didn't he? Where he actually stopped doing that for a bit. I didn't yeah. think. That's why Lookman's come back so well. You know, when, yeah, he's, yeah. He, when he's tried the Panenka down the middle and the goalie just catches it in one hand. At the end of the season, you might look back on that as a. As yeah, a, but he's also performed brilliantly. You know, for the kid, I thought he might go under from there, but I, he's he's impressed me the way he's coped with that mentally. Well, speaking of, of pressure, and Daryl Jacob alluded to it earlier when we heard from him, the, the atmosphere in the weighing room at Aintree is going to be a very different beast to what it is normally because it is Grand National Day. And, e and even though there aren't crowds there, which is a great shame, everyone knows what they're going out to do. And um, all the jockeys I speak to say there's no feeling like riding in the Grand National. It's the pinnacle. But you know from 
playing in high profile matches, just the difference in intensity for a sportsman and woman to to deal with that? How, how, what would your sort of advice be to people like Tabitha who are having their first rides in the race? Yeah, well, she's not going to experience the dressing room, is she? You know, they're going to have their separate dressing yeah, rooms, yeah. which is a bit of a shame for them, you know, because that, that buzz of the big big occasion, you know, when you're around the boys. And as well, and, Ireland and England will be split because of COVID oh, okay. as well, so there'll be even less of more dispersion yeah. throughout. Yeah, that. I mean, you look here, when we see the pictures, you know, and we, and we see the same old guys in there who are getting them all ready, you know, it's brilliant. It's a wonderful buzz, but in, in football in terms, it's that little bit extra when it's a big game it's, the, it's that heart rate just picks up you know and as a manager you have to try and be calm but I'm telling you inside you, you're not that calm you know you, you and, and it's the worst feeling in the world being a man I, lo- I perversely like the pressure but when you set your team up to perform a certain way once they cross that line you're in the lap of the gods and like I say, when you need some, that's when you need the responsible. That's when you need the Hoy Yes, yeah, when you need the Harry Kane's, someone's, the Ward Prowse's, the people who you know haven't kept you up. And whatever they give is everything. Yeah. They're gonna, they know one pace and that's flat out and they leave nothing on the pitch. It's the other ones who can win you the game, by the way. Yeah. The Mavericks, they can <laughs> win you who, you, who you need and you need a blend. They're the ones who can let you down at the most difficult times. Yeah. I'm trying to think who the sort of maverick jockey is or who the like Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Reliable is, but I suppose Rachel Blackmore's the one who can handle the pressure. She pro- proved that at Cheltenham. So Manella Times for the listeners and viewers might be the one to side with in the, in the Grand National. I just think that when you're, when you're there, they're going to obviously all be in the separate bit and in the, in the dressing room. If you see someone that's a little bit, look a bit nervous, you can go and give them a little bit of a chat, can't you, as a player, the same as a manager. But in there, it wouldn't surprise me where there's not many bodies around, it don't really happen. Like it's not going to have that yeah. that buzz about it. Do you know what I mean? You have the quiet ones, and then you have the loud ones, and then mm-hmm. it, it is inevitable. You're going to have a couple of nervous people, but a lot, having people around you does does help. And what's um, what's interesting when you when we have cameras in the weighing room, obviously I don't know whether we can this year at ITV, but but you might have a fixed one or whatever. You see some of the jockeys just having a nap beforehand, like you know, not a care in the world, and then you obviously see some jockeys that are getting nervous. But back in the day, you know, going back 20, 30 years. Yeah. Jockeys would go out on the tear the night before. Yeah. They'd be leathered in the clubs. Yeah. Then turn up at the races. This is long before it got a lot more professional and yeah. breathalysers yeah. and whatnot. And I think that was probably their way of dealing with it, just to sort of to try and act as normal as possible, take the edge off and not sort of, you know. And they had their phones in there as well. Yeah, so yeah. they could speak to people, couldn't they? Yeah, 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 yeah Which, exactly, is, which yeah. is completely different now. But like we were talking about it earlier in the North London Derby or whatever games, when we tried to find an edge, I'm sure the jockeys are in there and they were saying, you know, if someone looks a bit nervy, if I'm on a main jockey in there, I'm saying, Leo, you're shitting yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I remember playing against Liverpool when they were beating everyone. They were winning in Europe. And I remember Ronnie Whelan in the tunnel looking across at us. And it was, it was a compliment for him to recognise that we were there because the Liverpool players just were like that. I was thinking, this is just another statistic here. And I remember him saying, they are shitting themselves, boys. We ain't got nothing to beat here. You, you imagine that, and, and he's fucking right. You know, he's thinking, <laughs> you know, back in the day when you pulled up at Anfield, they would. It was none of that. Like you, none of that. It was almost they would just out the windows. They would go. You're looking at the bus, and you go, yeah, I'll fucking take that. Yeah. They go four, five. They're like, where's yeah, you we'll going? Five, probably. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, yeah. we're gonna get on our way. Yeah. And that was it. But that's well, just an aura, though, a swagger, isn't it? A confidence about being the best, right? Absolutely, but. They did just but like I say, he didn't need to. He don't need an edge. They're the best players ever. But they find it. They just find another one. Just to, just in case you had a little bit of life in you, he just killed you. I love that story. Yeah, I'd be terrified. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, Ronnie. Cheers, Cheers mate. Uh, yeah, look at them. Shit, look. Look at their faces. Look. Oh yeah. my god. Look at their shit. Oh, we ain't got nothing to beat here. <laughs> okay, it's time now on studs up for our. Um Studs up double, and I think series one has actually, even though we haven't had a double, I'm going to just defend us now in the studs up dressing room because we've had eight selections. I think between us, we've had a near enough a winner every week, but we've never managed to join forces and have the double come in. So let's hope that the uh, the entry meeting can land a double. Who are you going for? Lynn Sagar Oscar in the stayers hurdle for me. Rebecca Curtis, she he fell at, um, at Cheltenham. I just think he got one better this time. He, um, he was a stairs hurdle winner at Cheltenham a couple of years ago, but as you say, no luck at uh, Cheltenham, hoping for more luck at Aintree. I've actually got a horse running um, on Friday at Aintree, so I've got to put him in. I own a very small share in two for gold, who runs in the Topham, which is a race over the Grand National Fences on the Friday. Uh, this has been the target all season. Um, he's training really well. He actually finished behind Cloth Cap at Kelso. 
uh, last time out. So the form, um, if you're a cloth cup fan, cloth cap fan, you want to see how my horse gets on on Friday and then probably double your stakes if he wins. So that's my selection. Two for gold on Friday and Liz Nagaroska for Chaz on the Saturday. Uh, as always, Skybet have got great offers uh, on the app for Aintree. First up, and there's loads of offers this week, on Thursday there's a money back as cash offer. That's if your horse finishes second. Uh, and then they're paying extra places on the Aintree Bowl, which will see Tiger roll in, the Aintree Hurdle and the Red Rum Chase. So I actually quite like Zanzar in that race. And then for the Grand National itself on Saturday, Skybet are paying six places which is great for each way backers. So six places in the Grand National, 11 places in the Masters, and loads of great racing to enjoy this weekend from Aintree. It has been an absolute pleasure being in the Studs Up dressing room for the first time, long overdue, and it's been, um, been a joy, as we knew it would be, Chaz. Yeah, mate, long overdue, very enjoyable. Thanks very much for coming in, Tim. Pleasure. Made it a pleasure. Tim, yeah, that was fascinating. Enjoy the great week of sport. Thanks so much for your time and reminiscing on your career there. And, um, Hopefully, fingers crossed, pointing our listeners and viewers in the way of a few winners. <laughs> um, top man, thank you as always to you for tuning in. Like, subscribe, do whatever you need to do. But one thing you definitely should do is enjoy uh, this weekend of just world-class sport all around the globe. We'll see you next time on Studs Up. We've had a lot of fun doing Studs Up and uh, we trust the people that we work with to, to not make us look like fools, don't we? Yeah, like I say, so it's been in... 10 weeks has been very much enjoyable. Yeah. But now I'm, I'm not too sure, mate. Yeah, they said, don't worry, mate, nothing in series one will make you look like idiots. The reason we're doing this, obviously, Charlie, is because it's Grand National Week, as we know, so we're going to have our very own race. On final furlong two, in our silks, the blue versus the red. Good luck. It's on. I'm going to pick the pink one. Well, I've got magic seven here. Top peach. Five -year -old man. Keep the pace off the pack during the first half of the race. No problem. Sit and hold. Have you ever ridden a horse? Never ridden a horse. I've got to be honest with you, I think I'd be a bit scared. Here we go. I'd be a Good bit luck, scared. Mate. Here we go. Good luck, pal. Go on then. Get over there, put him in the rail, a bit sharpish. Is that you? I'm outside trying to get I'm holding up, mate. You've got way better techers than me. What is this? Oh, this is an absolute blow. Where are I? Oh my God. I'm doing a handicap job, I think. I'm going for it. No! no. It's not. <laughs> He's got what? He's doing a my bike! He's doing a my bike! I've got it, Bell! Come on, you I can't get there! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, my day's up, sorry. Well, Charles, that's it, mate. It's, mate, it's been enjoyable, eh? Loved it. Thanks for all your help, bud. Mate, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. We started on Zoom. Ended in jockey silks. <laughs> but it has been great fun. Yeah. And um, I think if that's anything to go by, definitely Red's probably the horse you want to side with in the, uh, the Round Ox Grand National on Saturday, right? I'll leave it there, pal. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> See you next time.